So it's my pleasure to host uh, virtually this week, Sunset Lee from uh, McMaster University in Hamilton. He's also a joint faculty at Perimeter Institute. Um, before coming to Hamilton, where he's now a full professor, Sensik was a postdoc at first, well, uh, first in Korea, but then at the Kavli Institute in Santa Barbara, and then at MIT. Um, worked on many great things, very challenging problems. So if I mention the main three I know, uh, so on quantum spin liquids of various kinds, um, he also worked on the Fermi surface that's coupled to a critical boson, and that's also related to Fermi liquid, to spin liquids, but not only, it's more general. And it's a very challenging problem that uh, many theorists, both in condensed matter and high energy, have been trying to, uh, to resolve. Um, and the third point, which we'll hear more about today, is the holographic duality, but beyond string theory, so beyond ADS CFT, uh, more generally trying to. Uh, understand a dual of some strongly coupled quantum field theory and many new ideas on uh, RG as a consequence of that. So, so sounds like uh, the floor is yours. And look hey. forward to your talk. Thank you, Will, for, for the introduction and the invitation. So, uh, so, so this talk is about uh, renormalization group. Um, uh, but please, uh, I, I understand that this is a mixed audience, so please stop me and ask question anytime during the talk. So, so renormalization group flow describes how effective theories for long distance modes evolve as we gradually integrate out uh, short distance modes. Um, although it's rather simple idea in retrospect, uh, is very important and indeed uh, actually forms a cornerstone in our modern physics uh, because it uh, provides a concrete route through which we can define effective field theories and uh, we can use um, effective field theories to understand long distance physics without having to understand everything at short distance scales and from the fixed points of the RG flow, uh, we can classify different phases of matter. And also there's a close connection between RG and the ADCFT correspondence. Um, so just to set the stage, uh, let's consider uh, Euclidean uh, field theory defined on say d-dimensional space. And um, here's the partition function. Say phi just collectively represent uh, fundamental fields in the theory. And I have chosen to <clears throat> divide my action into S naught, which represent a, a fixed point action. Um, it can be a Gaussian fixed point or it can be more complicated, interesting fixed point. But detail is not important here. And, and some deformation added to the fixed point. And, uh, and the deformation, for example, can be <clears throat> written as some linear superposition of uh, various uh, local operators that you can turn on. So this O of uh, M represents different kinds of uh, local operators where M includes the space coordinate and also some discrete indices for different types of local operators. And J superscript M represent uh, coupling or sources for, the, for that operator. And then uh, we divide uh, the fundamental field into fast mode and uh, slow mode. And uh, we can integrate out the fast mode. If there was no deformation, then then by construction, the fixed point action uh, it remains unchanged. Uh, but in the presence of deformation, in general, um, um, 
there's a new correction that is generated from integrating out those high energy modes. And, um, and this evolution of this deformation defines the uh, Wilsonian RG flow. In general, uh, even if one starts with a, a relatively simple theory <clears throat> uh, under the RG flow, all couplings that are local and respect the symmetry are generated under the RG flow. Okay, so in general, the exact RG flow is defined in, in, in some infinite dimensional space of uh, couplings. So we know in the low energy limit, um, the RG flow is attracted toward some low energy manifold uh, where the RG flow within that manifold is controlled by a, a small set of uh, relevant and marginal operators. Um, so usually in the continuum limit, um, we only think about field theory within those manifold. However, um, at high energies, the RG flow is much more complicated and um, um, in general, it's very hard to keep track of the exact RG flow because uh, one has to include operators made of arbitrarily many fields and derivatives. Okay. Um, so, uh, but uh, but there is an alternative uh, way of uh, formulating RG. So this is um, so-called quantum renormalization group. So it's an exact ref reformulation of the Wilsonian RG that I just explained. Um, the main difference is that the uh, Wilsonian RG is defined in the space of all possible couplings allowed by symmetry. Uh, whereas the quantum RG um, um, is defined in a, in, a, in a much smaller subspace. Okay, um, so here pictorially, I represent the subspace in terms of this say two dimensional manif uh, uh, manifold here. The, the price to pay uh, is that uh, the RG flow within the subspace is fluctuating. In other words, um, there's a genuine fluctuations within within the within the subspace. So so so. In other words, the RG flow is confined within a subspace of coupling, but. Uh, you have to sum over all RG paths within the subspace. And then uh, there is a weight for each RG path. So it's like a path integration over all possible RG paths. Um, so mathematically, the partition function um, of the field theory, say, in the Euclidean uh, space, is given by um, the sum of all RG paths. Here, um, little j sub little n uh, is um, uh, are the, uh, represent those coupling within the subspace. Okay, uh, it does it doesn't include a full set of coupling, but it's a subset of coupling. So that's why I use a little n. But uh, these couplings are not fixed at a given scale, as it is the case in the Wilson and RG. It is a dynamical variable. And- uh, Do you mind very much uh, defining the RG flow? Sorry? Could, could you uh, please define the RG flow? RG flow, okay. So this is what defines the RG flow. So you divide your field into uh, uh, Fast, fast mode and slow mode. So you can do it, say, in the momentum space. You can define some momentum cutoff. And then those modes whose momentum is bigger than your cutoff, you, you call it fast mode. And momentum uh, smaller than your cutoff as a slow mode. 
and then you integrate out the fast mode, okay? And then the action for your slow mode is modified from, ori from the original action, okay? So this is delta S. So the theory flows from, say, S0 plus S1 into S0 plus S1 plus some new term delta S1. And then if you repeat it, you can have a flow of the action. You can you, you gradually lower the UV cutoff. Then as a function of the UV cutoff, the action, effective action changes. Okay, so this is what, uh, what the RG flow is. Thank you. Uh, so that's the that's the usual. So this this is the this this is a space of theory, or you can view it as a space of coupling. Okay, so infinite dimensional space of coupling, and under this procedure, your theory, effective theory, uh, changes as a function of uh, the cutoff scale. Okay, that's the Wilson and RG flow. But this flow is uh, fully deterministic in the user RG, given that if you know the coupling at a given scale, you definitely know what the new couplings are at a slightly lower energy scale and so on. So this is uh, fully deterministic. But it's- uh, uh, sorry, sorry to be a pest, but uh, um, a flow in the usual mathematical sense is an abelian group action. Is this a group or a semi-group? Uh, no, it, 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 does, it doesn't form a group in the, in the, in the mathematical sense, yeah. It just, uh, I mean, I'm using the term flow in the sense that uh, a theory, effective theory at a given scale, give rise to another effective theory at a slightly lower energy scale and, and, and so on. So in other words, yeah, maybe I, I can write. So you have some different uh, coupling, coupling J, and then this depends on scale. So this Z is a um, scale uh, that, that parameterize your uh, UV cutoff. Suppose initially you have a UV cutoff lambda, but you lower the UV cutoff by Factor of e to the minus z, and then this is the new coupling defined uh, at scale uh, z, and then so-called uh, the beta function describes how this um, coupling changes as a function of scale, and then usually this is called as a minus of beta function, which is function of the, those coupling themselves. Okay. So this is uh, just, uh, when I say it's a flow, I mean, uh, this first order differential equation that describes how those couplings are evolving as a function of scale z. Okay. So, so there's no group property, there's no inverse. Yeah, in general, in general, uh, there's no inverse. Um, okay, so, but, uh, but uh, uh, in quantum RG, what we do is um, instead of considering deterministic RG flow defined in the full space of coupling, you deal with path integration of RG flow within the subspace, okay? So instead of considering the full coupling, you only consider subset of coupling here, but, the subset of coupling is not fixed under the RG flow. Instead, you sum over all RG paths, okay? So this uh, JN of Z is a scale dependent coupling, right? So it's a one, so it's a RG path. And this integration over this path is a path integration over RG path. And then um, the weight for each path is determined by some action, dynamical action for those uh, uh, coupling uh, uh, J 
of n. Okay. Um, so this is this is just a. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not dividing this. I'm just uh, um, uh, telling you what it is. Uh, so I will I will come back to 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 this later. But uh, the main idea is that. Um, Although the RG flow is projected to a subspace, um, the fluctuations of those coupling within the subspace captures the couplings that are not included in the RG flow. So therefore, uh, you can take into account those couplings that are outside this uh, subspace. Okay. And um, another point is that this action that determines the weight for each RG path is uh, in general a one higher dimensional theory. If your original field theory is a d-dimensional field theory, right, then this uh, coupling, coupling is in general a, a, a function of d-dimensional coordinate x, right, and maybe some different uh, uh, um, discrete indices for different kinds of coupling. But also, but but in this case, you you there's an extra coordinate z because uh, it's a scale dependent coupling, and you are summing over all scale dependent RG paths. So therefore, in that sense, um, it's a theory defined in one higher dimensional uh, space. Okay, so so there are various ways of understanding this, but uh, um, um, the easiest way. Uh, uh, starts with the uh, um, realization that uh, uh, the space of theories, space of uh, theories, can be viewed as a, as a vector space or Hilbert space. Okay, so here's what I do. Suppose I have an action S of phi. Then associate with that action, I can define a state in the vector space whose wave function is given by e to the minus s, okay? where this um, cat of phi just represent the basis, uh, basis um, state whose inner product is given by the user inner product here. So phi is, you can view it for the d-dimensional Euclidean field theory, phi is a, is a d-dimensional state, right? Um, like coherent state with uh, with this inner product, so that that is a basis state, and then you promote the Boltzmann weight e to the minus s as a wave function. By doing so, you can define a a state, okay, associated with each action, okay. So I can I I define the state for the fixed point action as not. Similarly, I I can define a state for that deformation S1. Okay, so the the um, the reason for 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 introducing this state is because the original partition function can be then uh, be viewed as a inner product between uh, the state associated with the uh, fixed point action and the state associated with the deformation. Okay, you can see the, the inner product between these two state with this uh, inner product give rise to the original partition function here. Okay. Okay, so this is just a, um, I didn't do anything. But then uh, the RG flow that I described before. Uh, where you, you divide the slow mode and fast mode and integrate out the fast mode to generate the new, new theory for the slow mode. That RG flow can be understood as a, as, as a, a evolution generated by some quantum operator. Okay. So, uh, so um, we can consider some coarse graining operator, I call it coarse graining Hamiltonian, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not really Hamiltonian, it's a generator for the coarse graining. And um, I can choose this uh, 
operator such that it annihilates the it annihilate the state associated with the fixed point action when, when it is applied from the right this way. So, uh, uh, so intuitively, you can think of H as a generator of course graining transformation. And because S0 is a fixed point action, fixed point should be unchanged under, the, under this course graining transformation. So therefore, uh, we require that um, the fixed point action, the state associated with a fixed point action S0 is invariant under the transformation that generate the course graining. So it is this statement, okay? So one can find some quantum operator H uh, that satisfy this condition that, that annihilate the fixed point state. And, um, and therefore uh, you, can, you can insert this uh, course graining operator between this bracket without changing the partition function because uh, when it is applied to the left, it doesn't do anything, right? But when, when it is applied to the right, then, um, you know, this new state uh, in general uh, uh, changed the state associated with the deformation, okay? From S1 to a state with a new action, S1 plus delta S1, okay? Where this S1 plus delta S1 is a, is a state obtained by applying this coarse graining evolution to, to the state with the deformation S1, okay? So, so the claim here is that um, once you fix your RG scheme, okay? And, um, and then if you have a fixed point, S0, also that is, whose action is on, uh, unchanged under the RG transformation, you can find some quantum operator H, which annihilate your, your fixed point state like this and generate the, the RG flow in terms of uh, uh, this uh, quantum evolution. So here's a, here's a concrete example. Let's consider a FIFO theory, okay? Um, and um, uh, say we, with a G2 symmetry, for example, where uh, theory is uh, invariant under phi goes to minus phi, like Eisen, Eisen theory, right? And uh, um, uh, here I have chosen my fixed point action to be the Gaussian theory, phi square, and this, this, uh, this term here is a uh, regularized kinetic term. It can be of, of the k square times something that suppressed the uh, fluctuation at, at momentum much bigger than lambda. So you can have some soft cutoff like this, k square divided by lambda square. Right? So that way for k much smaller than lambda, it's a user uh, kinetic term, but when k is much larger than lambda, the propagator of the phi field is exponentially suppressed. So this is just a, some smooth, uh, smooth cutoff, right? Uh, and then, you know, uh, it's easy to show that, uh, you know, under, under coarse graining and rescaling of the field and, and um, space, this Gaussian action S not is invariant. Okay, so it's a fixed point action under some RG transformation. And everything else I, I included in S1 that includes phi to the fourth term and high order term, et cetera, okay? And then, um, you know, um, um, the, the course grading Hamiltonian that I mentioned is that leaves the S0 invariant is given by, by this Hamiltonian here where this pi, pi is a operator that is conjugate to phi, okay? So in the, in the phi basis, pi is basically minus i times phi k phi, right? So this is a, just conjugate momentum. So 
Um, so the, the first term here, the first term in this RG Hamiltonian basically um, corresponds to integrating out the high energy mode. Uh, so if you, have, if you have some cortic vertex like this here, right? Uh, then then um, uh, this pi derivative with respect to phi eliminate one of the one of the phi field, right? So that uh, if you apply this uh, if this Hamiltonian to the quartic vertex, then what what happens is that you know you 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 eliminate this uh, two phi field and replace with this uh, some uh, propagator of the high energy mode essentially and give rise to the uh, quadratic term. Or if you have a two quartic vertex, then you know, you contract a pair of phi field and fuse the quartic vertex into six six order vertex, right? So this is this is what this uh, first term does. And then uh, the second term is just uh, rescaling of the field and space coordinate that makes sure that the S naught is invariant. Okay, and this this uh, R G Hamiltonian. Uh, when 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 it is applied to to the any deform any deformation S one that includes quartic and six order term etc., it uh, it exactly reproduces the um, flow equation that uh, that you 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 can derive from from the um, exact RG. Okay, so this this reproduce so called the uh, Puchinsky RG equation. So, Sonsik, can I yeah. just ask in your middle line, I mean, the bras and kets were somehow states in, in theory space. And, and you, you initially said this uh, in DZH hat is not really an operator, but it's an operator. I mean, in terms of field operators, it's an operator in that theory space. So now you're writing S not, which is just in terms of field operators. So is okay. there some, some kind of- so, so these states are indeed defined in the theory space, but still the basis vectors of this uh, Hilbert space or vector space is still this uh, uh, phi. So phi is the uh, um, fundamental field and for, for every, uh, space configuration of phi, you have one state, okay? And that, that they form a basis state. And then the wave function in that basis is the action of your theory, okay? okay. So, so, right. Yeah. Okay, so the, I don't, the cat phi, I don't understand what it, how it, how it is a, represents a theory it, it, to me it represents oh, a... phi phi cat phi doesn't represent a theory the action represents a theory so this is a this is what determines a theory right yeah yeah but action is a um action takes the field configuration of phi as an input and then output is some number right that's the action action is a functional of the phi configuration Okay. So, so the, I, I understand this as sort of shirting a representation of the field theory or something like that. Um, well, it, it is related, but, but here, suppose, suppose I have a D-dimensional, suppose I have a one-dimensional field theory, right? Suppose this is a one-dimensional space. Let's make it uh, lattice to be, to be concrete, mm. right? So then, you know, Suppose I have a real scalar field phi, right? And then usually when we compute the partition function, right? With some of all field configuration with some action S, right? So that means if I have some configuration of phi, something like this, this is one configuration that is included in this integration, right? And yeah. for this configuration, I have an action that determines the Boltzmann weight, okay? That is, that is a theory. But now what I'm doing here is I'm defined, for this field configuration, I define a state 
labeled by that field configuration. Okay. Okay. So for every five configuration in real space, I have a, I have a state. That's a basis state. And then using that basis state, I promote my Boltzmann weight e to the minus s as a weight function. Then I can define a state for every action by promoting this e to the minus s as a weight function in this phi basis. Okay, this is my, this is my uh, state. So, so this is my state associated with uh, action S. It's so for theory now, with, it's associated yeah. with the theory. Is yeah, that... yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, so it's, still a linear, it's still a linear combination of, of states of your field. Yes, yeah, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay, here, so here the main point was that uh, the usual exact Polchinski IG equation um, can be understood as some flow generated by some quantum Hamiltonian, quantum operator H that acts on this state associated with, uh, with action. Uh, but now, so usually, usually you just uh, you just uh, in this picture you just uh, keep applying this coarse graining operator for for any RG time you want, right? And then this define a deformation at low energy scale. And then you just keep track of the S1, Z, because th th this you can also write as uh, some, uh, as a wave function of new action for phi defined at scale Z in the phi basis, okay? So the Z dependence of this S1 is the RG flow that that, that is the exact RG flow, okay? But, but the point is that in general, S1 is very complicated and um, S1 includes all sorts of uh, operators that are allowed by, uh, by symmetry. In the example of the FIFO theory, this S1 includes any powers of phi to D2, right? All those couplings are allowed. Not just uh, and then any as as many derivative, derivatives as 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 you wish. Okay, those 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 operators are all or generated under under the R G flow. But uh, but uh, we can actually take advantage of the linear superposition principle once we once we realize that the space of theory can be viewed as a vector space. So it's a vector space. So there must be some smaller set of uh, basis state, which can span this base, uh, the vector space, okay? So that instead of, uh, instead of um, um, labeling um, a, a theory, say, in terms of its action S1, right, we can, represent a theory as a linear portion of some basis state, okay? So, so, so here I have written, here I denoted a basis state in this way where each basis state is labeled by um, little j. Little j is the uh, coupling for some particular set of operators, O, O, N. Where this O N are so-called single trace operators. The definition of single trace operators is the following. So single trace operators are the minimal set of operators um, in terms of which uh, all other operators can be written as polynomial. Okay. So so 
so for example in the in the ising theory that i that i mentioned for 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 the for the real real g2 uh symmetric scalar theory at like ising ising theory right um the the those single trace operators are bilinear operators of this phi field, say phi x and phi y. Okay. So these 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 operators is symmetric under global G2 transformation. Okay, so it is allowed by symmetry. And all other G2 symmetric operators can be written as composite of those of these these uh, these operators. Okay, so 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 in in this case, this this form a uh, so-called single trace operator. Okay, but more generally, in any theory, you can define single trace operators as a set of uh, operators from which all other symmetry allowed operators can be written as uh, polynomial. Okay, so this uh, this uh, curly O with a capital M is the most general operators allowed by symmetry. And then this uh, O of uh, uh, little n, they are set of, uh, they are building blocks, okay? And then as composite of these single trace operators, the general operators can be written as polynomial, okay? So these are the um, single trace operators. And, and then the claim is that the, uh, the this state J, whose wave function is given by just single trace operators O form a complete basis, okay? Um, in other words, if I have some generic deformation, okay? Suppose I have some deformation S1, okay? And then by definition, uh, this uh, deformation S1 can be written as uh, some of some generic operators, right, as we wrote before. But uh, by definition, uh, these operators can be written as polynomials of single trace operators, okay? So these are, this can be written as a products of some, products and sums of those uh, single trace operators. So therefore, uh, uh, any deformation can be written in this way, where the wave function can be written as just a single, single trace operators like this, then one can easily show that uh, such state can be always written as a linear superposition of those basis state, provided that you choose your wave function in a, in a way that depends on the source for those, uh, source for those operators. So I'm not proving this, but I'm, I'm just uh, um, uh, stating uh, the, the fact that you can, you can show that. Um, so it's not surprising because this J is uh, basically um, some J already includes includes the single trace operator for every possible single trace operator. So by by doing some linear combination of this, you can you can reproduce some high order terms in O. For example, if you choose this if you choose this uh, wave function to be Gaussian, right? In in J, if it is a Gaussian like minus J square, right? Then in the presence of in the in the and then if you integrate over this J, then you, 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 you immediately generate some uh, double trace operator, square of O operator, right? So, uh, and, and, and this, this argument can be generalized that um, any, any state uh, can be written as a linear superposition of those state, basis state, whose wave function includes only single trace operators. Okay. Now in this picture, um, if you apply the RG Hamiltonian, I mean evo RG evolution to, to the state with the deformation S1, right? This new state also 
can be written as a linear superposition of the of basis state, right? Because uh, basis states are complex. But then this wave function will be scale dependent on that, okay? So in this language, the RLG flow now can be uh, understood as a uh, evolution of this wave function psi defined in the space of uh, single trace couplings. Okay. So the deterministic RLG flow defined in the space of full couplings is now uh, uh, a, a evolution of wave function psi and the wave function is defined in the space of uh, single trace coupling. Okay, so that is the um, essence of uh, quantum RG. So, okay, so let me maybe pause here to see if there is any question so far. Okay, so, so um, just a few comments. So um, this theory that uh, D plus one dimensional theory that arises here that determines the weight for each RG path uh, naturally is a theory of uh, dynamical gravity. Um, and that's because in field theory, you always have an energy momentum tensor in your theory, energy momentum operator. And the source for the energy momentum tensor is nothing but metric, okay? And then in this scheme, those coupling become dynamical. So therefore, um, the RG path, the sum over RG path include sum over metric as well. So that's why, the 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 uh, geometry become dynamical in in along along the RG flow in in this scheme. And also, although here I have written this path integration in a rather abstract way, usually path integration is not well defined in the continuum. But if you if your field theory, say d dimensional field theory, is um, uh, regularized, it's a finite theory, then as you apply this uh, quantum RG, the D plus one dimension theory is also automatically regularized. So, so that also uh, is a finite theory. Okay, so that, that are the that's two points. Okay, so so far the discussion has been rather abstract. So let me give, let me give you an example. So let's consider a uh, Euclidean field theory with n component of complex field. Okay, so phi at each side i, I have a n flavor where a runs from one to n. Okay, so it's, uh, and uh, let's consider a uh, theory that respect the uh, un global uh, symmetry. Okay, and uh, and then the most general action that respect this uh, un un symmetry. Can be written this way. So I, 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 in the first term, I just singled out the own side mass term, and this is uh, still quadratic, but this some um, hoping. I'm using lattice regularization. Ij represent side index in the d-dimensional Euclidean space, Euclidean lattice, and then I have a quartic interaction and so on. Okay. And uh, this, this uh, phi star that this, this phi star dot phi i is, uh, is um, you know, flavor index is summed over. So it's a flavor singlet, okay? So a, a, a is summed over. And then more generally, you can define a bilocal operator defined, side, defined as side i and j, uh, where the flavor index is contracted. And these are the, these are the single trace operator, okay? In that, or other operators that are invariant under UN symmetry can be written as uh, polynomials of this uh, multi-trace, of the, the single trace operators like this, right? So for example, this quartic interaction here is just uh, 
OIJ for KN, right? It's a, it's a quadratic sum of those single trace operators. In that sense, um, uh, this is single trace operator and single trace operators are labeled by this two coordinate. It's a bilocal in that sense, okay? And then um, there's a, you can think about the basis state, okay? And here, the basis state is labeled only by um, this bilocal field TIJ. So this is um, uh, this is the source for the for the single trace uh, operator. Okay. So, but here I have included one quartic interaction to make sure that uh, this state is normalized normalizable. Okay. For any for some choices of TIJ. Um, this first term alone may not be, may give a wave function that is not normalizable at, at large phi. So to make, to make sure that the wave function is normalizable, I included a quartic term with some fixed strength lambda. But this lambda is fixed. So you, you choose any lambda, one, for example. And, and, then, and then you just label your uh, state in terms of this uh, bilocal field Tij, okay? And then, this set of state with different T form a complete basis, okay? In other words, if you have any action that is invariant under UN symmetry, the state associated with that action can be always written as a linear proportion of those state, basis state T, okay? So that is the, in, in this sense, the set of state T uh, form a complete basis, okay? And then, uh, then this partition function of this UN vector model can be written as an overlap between two states, between um, um, S0, where S0, I have chosen to be the fixed point action for a trivial state. It's a, it's a gap state. Okay, so the, the insulating fixed point. Okay, so there's no kinetic term, there's no gradient term, it's just a ultra local term. And indeed, uh, you can show this is a fixed point action for, for the insulating trivial fixed point. Then everything else, this part, the hoping term and quartic interaction and high order interaction, everything else as, as I, then, then I include them into my deformation. So I have a state associated with the deformation S1. Okay, and then the partition function is given by the overlap between S0 and S1 state, okay? And then uh, you can uh, devise a coarse graining Hamiltonian which annihilate the uh, uh, insulating fixed point state uh, invariant, okay? So uh, this H, this H is a coarse graining Hamiltonian uh, uh, that is also quadratic in pi. Here, pi is again the conjugate momentum of uh, phi, okay? And it's similar to the course graining Hamiltonian <clears throat> in the, in the, in the Polchinski RG equation that I uh, discussed in the momentum space. But here, since I have chosen the fixed point action to be ultra local, it's a trivial insulating fixed point the course graining Hamiltonian that leaves that insulating fixed point unchanged is also ultra local in real space, okay? So, and then because of this property, you know, partition function is invariant under the insertion of this uh, RG evolution operator between S0 and S1, okay? But now, uh, once this uh, coarse graining operator x to the right to the to the deformation, then it, it generates the evo non-trivial evolution, which is the uh, RG flow of the deformation. Okay. Can I can I ask back there? Yeah, uh, yeah. This looks anti-hermitian or not hermitian. Uh, the the is that I? That's not the same I as you're not summing this I, right? So this eye is a side index, okay? Yeah, and this one? Oh, this eye yeah. is an imaginary eye, right. so, complex eye. So it's, it's not Hermitian, okay? It's not Hermitian, but 
this eigenvalues are real. So th this, these are so-called, um, so this respect uh, PT symmetry. So it's, it's not Hermitian, but it's related to the Hermitian operator through similarity transformation. This can be written as uh, S times some Hermitian operator S inverse. Okay. The reason why this operator RG Hamiltonian has to have real eigenvalue is because the free energy is real. So therefore the eigenvalue of this H give rise to the free energy of the partition function. So at, at the end of the day, this is E to the minus F, right? The free energy here. Because this is real, uh, the eigenvalue of this RG Hamiltonian has to be real. Okay, so now, now as, as we discussed this, uh, when, when this RG evolution acts to the right, to the deformation, then it create, it generate the quantum evolution of the wave function defined in the space of a single trace operator. So in this particular example, the partition function can be written as a path integration over uh, over the RG pass in this uh, single trace operator, TIJ is the coupling for the single trace operator, right? And then it's a Z dependent, it's a scale dependent. So you sum over all RG pass within the subspace of this TIJ, okay? And then uh, this is the initial wave function for this uh, deformation, S1. And then uh, there's a bulk theory that determines the weight for each RG path. And then this uh, Borg theory is a theory of uh, uh, dynamical bilocal field. Okay, so TIJ, the, the hoping for that connect site I and J become dynamical field in the Borg. And then S Borg is a, is a theory for this dynamical hoping field. Okay, so in, in this, in this quantum RG, the coupling become dynamical field. And then here the coupling is the uh, hopping between site I and J, okay? And, um, and here, here is the, here is the uh, expression for that uh, Hamiltonian, okay? So this is uh, action is given by this uh, Bell phase term plus Hamiltonian, okay? And um, this Bell phase term, you know, tells you that uh, this T and this is T and T star are kind of a coherent state representation of some um, uh, T and T dagger, right? In the operator picture, you have T and T dagger, which, which satisfies some uh, commutation relation and T corresponds to annihilation operator of connectivity between side I and J. T dagger is a creation operator, right? Just, just as a, you can annihilate and create a particle at a site. Here, you can annihilate and create an object defined on a, on a, on a link between site I and J, okay? Because the link variable become dynamic. And this Hamiltonian for this link variable determines the quantum dynamics of this connectivity, okay? So in, for example, you have this cubic term here. So this, what this cubic term does, is uh, if you have a link hopping between side I and J here and hopping between J and K, you annihilate them and then you create a new hopping between side I and K, right? So you, you basically fuse to say short range hopping into a longer range hopping. So that is, that is the result of the coarse graining, okay? So if, you, if, you, if, if your UV theory has only nearest, nearest neighbor hopping. Then under the coarse graining, the further neighbor hoppings are generated through this kind of process, okay? But one important thing is that, uh, so there's no bare kinetic term for, the, for, the, for this bilocal field. For example, hopping between IJ cannot just move to different link, say IK, right? This kind of process is not allowed. And that's because, um, there's no pre-imposed background here, okay? Um, 
But the absence of this kinetic term doesn't mean that this uh, hoping dynamics of dynamics of the hoping field is trivial, because um, once you solve the saddle point, and then if if those hoping fields acquire some non-zero expectation value, right, then this cubic term generate this quadratic term. Okay. For example, if if we replace this one of the field as a expectation value and the other include some small fluctuation like this, right? You, you write T as some expectation value plus small fluctuation. Then from this cubic term, you generate this quadratic term for this uh, bilocal field. And it, it, it describes now uh, motion or, or hoping of this hoping field. So initially I have a hoping between IJ and it can move to IK. As far as there is an appreciable connectivity between J and K. Okay, so this uh, expectation value of the hoping field themselves determine how far this hoping, this, uh, this bilocal object can move in real space. Okay, so therefore, the, um, this expectation value of this bilocal field determines the background geometry on which. This, this small fluctuations of the hoping field propagate. Okay, so it, it is in this sense that uh, geometry is is dynamical in the in the bulk. Okay, so so if you just uh, so so far everything is exact, and then for a given UV theory, you can evolve this uh, uh, your UV theory with this quantum Hamiltonian and observe how the hoping fields. Are renormalized, so it's a, in general it's a, it's a quantum process. But in the large and limit, you can you, you can uh, do the saddle point approximation, and you can solve the classical equation motion in the bulk, and and uh, figure out the expectation value of the hoping field as a function of this i and j, and also as a function of scale z. Okay, now if you do it. In the gap phase, if your theory is in the gap phase, then what happens is that as you go to IR, the range of hoping gradually increases because this short range hoping fuels to longer range hoping. But in the gap phase, the range of hoping doesn't increase forever, it saturates to some finite range, okay, in the gap phase. And here, <clears throat> as I mentioned, before, the typical range of hoping kind of determines the notion of what's nearest neighbor in the renormalized sense, okay? So, so, so therefore, the range of hoping, roughly speaking, determines the coordinate distance uh, with a unit proper distance. In, in other words, the metric is determined by the profile of the hoping field, TIG, at the set point, right? If you have a very long range hoping, right? That means uh, this bilocal field can hop from one side to another side very easily, which means that the proper distance between the two points is very short, okay? Whereas if the range of hoping is very small, then, you know, in order to move from one point to another point, it has to go through many, many hoping, right? That means the proper distance is very large. So in this way, um, uh, uh, the bulk geometries are uh, determined by the um, uh, profile of the T, the hoping field. And in the gap phase, indeed, um, uh, you, you have this uh, metric in the bulk. And this, uh, this is a metric where the, the uh, proper distance from the UV boundary to the IR is finite. Okay, so we do coordinate distance z is go to infinite, but the proper distance is finite. But then the, yeah, so it, it, it is like this. You have a, a boundary uh, space in the d-dimensional space, but then as you go to IR, the size of the boundary, proper volume of the boundary space shrink, but it saturate. And then as the proper distance from the boundary to the, IR is also finite. So it's kind of brick wall, brick wall kind of uh, uh, geometry. In the bulk, the 
geometry terminate at some finite proper distance in, inside the bar. Whereas if you are in the gapless phase, if you are at the critical point or in the superfluid phase, then um, the range of hoping increases without a bound. And then as you go to large Z limit, the range of hoping also diverges, which means that uh, the proper size of the D dimensional space time keep shrinking as you go to large Z limit, okay, without a bound. And this continues, and this this precisely gives the ADS ADS geometry here in the bulk. And then, uh, as I said, the range of hoping diverges at z equal infinity. So, in a sense, z equal infinity is a kind of critical point at which you know the length scale coordinate length scale diverges, and it is it is it is the point where there's a Poincaré horizon where where. Uh, uh, where the size of the uh, d dimension space shrink to, to zero in the large segment. Okay, so um, yeah, so there are some recent stories that I plan to talk about, but maybe for the sake of time, maybe I will stop here. Yeah, time time is up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I will I will uh, take question. Well, you can summarize, you can do your summary and then we can finish if you want to say some things like you okay. still have like one minute. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then I will just take uh, one minute to talk about some recent progress. So in quantum RG, so exact reformulation of the recent RG, but um, uh, quantum, the, the bulk theory that 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 is that is in, in quantum RG, actually depends only on the beta function in the subspace of single trace coupling, okay? So you, you don't need to know the full beta function to construct the action for the quantum RG. You only need to know the beta function on the subspace of single trace coupling because uh, any or other theory can be re written as linear proportion of those basis theory. So therefore, if you know the beta function, on the subspace of single trace coupling, then it you you can construct the bulk theory in quantum RG, and because it's an exact reformulation of the full Wilsonian RG, the full beta function of the Wilsonian RG can be actually extracted just from knowing the beta function in the subspace of single trace operator. So so therefore, um, there is very stringent constraint that beta functions actually have to satisfy in any field theory. For example, suppose I have a two-dimensional space of coupling where J1 is single trace and J2 is a, a, a double trace operator, square of the single trace operator, right? And what I'm saying is that if you know the beta function on this red line, this red line is the subspace of single trace coupling, right? And then this uh, completely fixed the uh, beta function everywhere on the two dimensional plane. Okay, so all the beta function away from this red line is fully encoded in the beta function defined in this, uh, in this uh, manifold of uh, single trace operator. Okay, so this is um, one, one point. Um, another point is that. Um, uh, this goes back to the first uh, point that I mentioned in the introduction. In the Wilson and RG, you know, all general operators are generated. So it is not easy to keep track of the exact RG flow. And, and therefore, it's hard to compute the exact effective action that arises in the IR. But quantum RG, um, you don't have to keep track of all operators. You, 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 need to include much smaller set of uh, single trace coupling. In general, it's not easier because it's, then you have to solve the quantum problem. But in the large and limit, you can do the um, set point approximation. So therefore, um, you end up with uh, some classical problem for much smaller set of uh, coupling. 
So therefore, it kind of sometimes allows us to compute the exact uh, effective action, solve the exact RG equation uh, using quantum RG. So recently, um, uh, we were able to compute the solve the exact uh, beta function for the ON vector model in the large energy using this uh, technique. Okay, so I will, I will really stop now. So William, are you here? No, it seems not. So he asked me to just take over as a moderator. So if there are any questions, please uh, just turn on your mic. Can uh, Sungsik, can, can I ask? I mean, so you're essentially proving this Maldasena conjecture or something along that line. Now, Maldasena's thing remains a conjecture. So what aspect of, I mean, can you frame Maldasena conjecture? in your language, and then what would you have to prove rigorously to uh, uh, to obtain it as a proof? Right, so the hope, the goal, so so the hope is that uh, for, for a general uh, field theory, this, this quantum RG allows one to construct the bulk theory, okay? That, that part is, uh, and then this bulk theory is, a, a, a theory of dynamical gravity in the park. What is not known is um, the continuum limit of those uh, uh, bulk theory. So, for, so for, as I mentioned, in order to make sure that the bulk theory is well-defined, I first need to start with some well-defined regularized field theory. For example, in the UN model, I use lattice regularization. And then I have a well-defined theory on a lattice. And then if you run this uh, uh, um, scheme, then you obtain this well-defined theory of uh, bilocal field theory in the park, TIJ. It's also a well-defined, it's a regularized theory. Okay? In, in principle, one can solve this theory in a computer. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it is, a, it is a theory of dynamical gravity. But what is not known is what, what kind of continuum limit does this uh, bulk theory has, okay? So that, that part is not known. For example, you know, if I have a lattice gauge theory at the boundary, and, uh, um, and then if you, if you apply this scheme, you will have some bulk theory. And then given that in the gauge theory, the, the single trace operators are within the operators. So therefore, single trace operators are defined in the space of loop. So in, in the bulk, you obtain some field theory of loop, loop variables or some kind of string field theory, formally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that can be done. What is not known is whether that theory that you, you, you obtain bulk kind of uh, reduces to known perturbative, say, string theory in the large and limit uh, uh, that, that, is, that is not known. If, if, if one can show that, that I, I guess that will be a proof of, of the conjecture. OK. Thank you. So any other questions? Please. Can you just say a word about why it would be ADS rather than some other geometry? OK, very good. So it doesn't have to be ADS, for example, uh, this geometry here that emerge in the gap phase is not ADS. It's, um, it's, uh, the, 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 it's a finite depth geometry in, 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 in the bulk direction. Okay. Um, um, only, in the, only in the gapless phase with uh, Z equal one dynamic with the, with the theory dynamical critical exponent one, um, uh, we, 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 we have ADS geometry. So but, but here, how do you see that? Is there some way to indicate why that is? Why, why, why it happens to be ADS here? Yes. Yeah, I guess here the reason, so by the way, this geometry is actually derived 
it, we, I, I didn't write it down. It, it can be derived explicitly in this scheme. And the reason why it is ADS is basically it's controlled by the, by the symmetry that includes the conformer, the scale transform under, under the scale transformation, um, you know, the, at the fixed point in the gapless, at the gapless fixed point, the space and space in the field theory direction has to be scaled um, as, as Z increases, okay, in, at the same rate. So this scale invariance basically uh, dictate it to be the ADS space. Um, but, uh, but there are other examples where of uh, scale invariant uh, theory, which, whose, ge whose geometry is not ADS. For example, if you, have, uh, if you have to scale time direction and space direction in a different way, right? In that case, you don't, you don't have ADS uh, geometry in the block. So here, here I guess um, um, the symmetry, the uh, um, conformal symmetry, and the, the uh, uh, that includes the, uh, uh, the, the you have to rescale the all direction in the space in the same way, and and um, you have a, a scale invariance that largely fix the ADS geometry. But it's a very interesting question, you know. It's basically a way to geometrize uh, different states of matter. Okay, so one may try to ask, you know, I have a, a certain state, and what kind of geometry will emerge for that for the state in the IR? Okay, so. Um, But um, in Maldacena's model, the, the boundary is something very specific. It's the uh, n equals four super Yang Mills on uh, compactified Minkowski space. And you're talking about quite different models. So I'm just wondering uh, what, uh, what property of the boundary theory is it that determines an ADS? Yeah. So, you know, that. Um... That Young Mill theory, the supersymmetric Young Mill theory, that is used in the original conjecture, is a particular conformal field theory, where the it is a it is a you know, but I, I don't think that is necessary, right? It doesn't have to be that. Uh, I mean, the, of course, uh, that theory is a strongly coupled, so there is a large gap. In the in the spectrum between the operators with a small scaling dimension and those operators with large scaling dimension, and uh, the theory still remains conformal, um, even as strong coupling, largely due to the supersymmetry. But probably, those supersymmetry is not really the uh, essential part of the story. Okay, and um, and I think uh, for any theory, you can have a gravitational. You can actually there there is a gravitational dual. Of course, for most theories, the gravitational dual is not useful. It's it's, it's uh, more complicated. In order for the gravitational dual to be useful, um, first of all, you know. Uh, quantum fluctuations in the bulk should be weak. So that usually requires some large n. And also, um, um, in order to have some field theory, field theory limit, okay? Um, for example, in this, in this example of UN vector model, it's not really a field theory because uh, it's a theory of bilocal field. It's a bilocal object, right? It's a fundamental field. It's not a local object. It's a bi-local. So it's some, in a sense, you know, in, in, in an extended object in the in a minimal sense. Okay. So, and this, and then um, you know, the, the, all those uh, all those bi-local objects are are important here. So this bi-local field can be viewed as uh, infinite towers of higher spin field here, and they they are presumably all important. So that means in the Borg, you have to deal with 
uh, many uh, many low energy fields. Okay, so that that complicates thing. Or even in the classical limit, even the large limit, you have to include um, many higher spin field in the bulk. Now, in order to have uh, in order to have a really local theory where you have you you have only small number of uh, low lying field, you need a gap between a uh, low lying operator with, uh, with the operators with large uh, scaling dimension. And for that, you need, uh, you need a strong coupling. So ideally, if you have uh, uh, some large end theory with a strong coupling, then uh, for such theory, this kind of gravitational dual can be useful. You can, you can use it to understand the dynamics of those strongly coupled field theory. But here, I guess my goal here uh, is first to understand the underlying dictionary, the microscopic um, um, way to derive the gravitational dual, starting from well-defined regularized field theory through first principle construction. And, and then once you construct the gravitational theory, that theory may or may not be useful, but, but um, here, the goal is first to have such um, first principle derivation of the bulk theory. Right. So I, I guess the main, main message is that in this philosophy, any theory, any field theory has a gravitational dual. And then um, most cases, the gravitational dual is not going to be useful. But in some large and strongly coupled field theory, um, the gravitational dual will become a uh, simple theory um, and can be useful. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, so I think uh, Manu Paranjapi had to go to teach, so I'm becoming the chair. So I'll invite uh, any further question. And if there's none, well, we'll thank the speaker. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Lee. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.